That inspires me to get up here every single Sunday. Just puts a little pep in my step, makes me happy. And uh, thrilled that you're here. A couple of global updates before I get into the series for today. One will touched on, but Lindsay Lee, who is our director of City Life and oversees all of our strategic partnerships locally, nationally, and internationally, she and her husband Ben are in Vietnam this weekend looking at a potential partnership. So be praying for them, the ministry and partnership there, but also the mode of transportation appears to be her on the back of a moped getting from place to place in Ho Chi Minh City. So pray for Lindsay and Ben and just, man, if God's leading us to this partnership, it seems like a lot of amazing things happening. And then we'll just touched on the fact that Adi from Impact Church in Aradia, Romania, will be with us next week. He is dynamic. You will not want to miss for that reason. But also, um, secondly, this will be the first time in Epic's history that any of our global partners have been to San Francisco and been in an Epic service. And so come to one of the three gatherings next week as well. If you um, aren't able to be here uh, because you're out of town, not because you went to brunch, um, make sure that you get the podcast of that because it's going to be super compelling. And we'll also tell you about what our work looks like moving forward in Romania. Romania. So be here for that. But now the continuation of this Never Enough series. In, in this series, we're just looking at a number of things and we're asking this question, could it ever be enough to actually sustain endless joy and consistent contentment in my life? Now here's what we know about ourselves. We are really driven people, aren't we? Some of us. And we're not vocal in church, but we're driven we're willing to get after it. We are willing to go raise the money. We are willing to build the team. We are willing to launch the product. We are willing to work 80 to 100 hours a week if necessary. We are willing to forsake certain relationships if that needs to be. We are willing to forego sleep, even though every single piece of research and study is telling us what about sleep right now. Anybody know? That we need more of it. All right, let's find some of your, some, some people choose to sleep during the 1030 gathering, which is totally <laughs> cool. Catch it when you can, you know. Um, but we're willing to forgo all of those things. We're willing to put in all of that time, all of that energy, all of that effort, if it means in the end, we will be successful. Because we've told ourselves, if we can just win one time, if we can just be successful in our industry or in a relationship or, or whatever the case may be, it will be enough to sustain us forever. But can one moment of success bring consistent contentment and endless joy? We tell ourselves it will, right? We tell ourselves early on in life, if I could just win the game, right? Just win the t-ball game and that will be successful. Of course, now in t-ball, they don't even keep score. So everyone's a winner. Teaches us so much about the real world, doesn't it? We know that if we can get into the university of our choice, then we will have success and we don't care about anything else because we think that admission letter and our parents paying for it will take care of everything that we need. But can a moment of success be enough? Or even not just a moment, can perpetual success be enough to satisfy us forever? I think the best way to start a message like this is with a quote from Madonna. Here's what Madonna said about her own success. Now remember, this is a woman who to date has sold over 300 million albums Since 1990 till the present day, just on her concert tours alone, she has grossed $1.3 billion. Here's what she says. She says, I have an iron will, and all of my will has always been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being. And then I get to another stage and think I'm mediocre and uninteresting. Whatever words you might use to describe Madonna, the word uninteresting wouldn't be on the list, would it? I was like, who's Madonna? (laughs) Go ahead and send your emails. Again and again, my drive in life is from this horrible fear of being mediocre. And that's always pushing me pushing me. Because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove that I'm somebody. My struggle has never ended, and it probably never will. Do you hear what she's admitting in that statement? She's admitting that I'm likely never going to find it in success, but I have to keep going after it. 
She's telling herself and telling us that it's probably not out there in the future if I haven't had it yet, if it hasn't sustained me yet, if there's always had to be a next thing and a next project and a next record and a next tour and a next man, if it hasn't sustained me yet, it's probably not going to, but I've got to keep swimming after it because maybe there's a magic number. Maybe there's an accolade. Maybe there's a number of Grammys that will do it for me. Now, if you've had some success, you resonate with this a little bit, don't you? Because we tell ourselves, if such and such will happen, I will be good, maybe not forever, but at least for the next year. But what happens? It always fades, doesn't it? It's always like the balloon that's letting out air. It's always, in the end, becoming something that's empty and has to be filled back up. And so what we might think is, no, Ben, I don't need a moment of success. I need a lifetime of success. I need this project to win. I need that project to win. First of all, you're not always going to win, right? Do you know the most successful baseball hitters in history fail six out of 10 times? You're not always going to win. And we've seen this kind of thing with Madonna. We've seen it in other athletes. I think about Brett Favre, not hating on my Packer friends, especially when one's the producer for this morning. (laughs) Do you know why he wasn't able to walk away from the game? Was it because he lacked success? Everybody's like, I don't know. I need a technology example, man. Like, help me out. He had incredible success, but he couldn't walk away from the game because he depended on it to be his everything. He depended on it to find his identity. And here's what Tim Keller says in his great work, Counterfeit Gods, one of the top five books I've ever read. I believe in it that strongly. I'll give you another quote from a a, a separate book that's in the top five. But here's what Keller says about this idea. He says, in the end, achievement can't really answer the big questions. So think about what you're after. Think about how you define success. It can't really answer these big questions. Who am I? What am I really worth? How do I face death? It gives the initial illusion of an answer. There's an initial rush of happiness. Everybody, you ever had that? Like you won, you, got, you beat the deadline, you hit the quota. You're, you're, you've been there, right? You've, won, you've all won some, right? Otherwise, we need to have a contest. Anybody that's never won, come to the stage right now. We're going to do a sing-off, and we're just going to say, you're the winner. For real. I run this joint. I can do a change. Come on. Come, anybody. We just need you to win one time. But, but we've all been there, and we've all, if you've ever been like me, like I tell myself, if we can just do this one thing, I'll be set for life. Have you been there? Even if you don't use those words, you think it, right? Right? So like if, if we just get the funding, and to be honest, I, I thought this about starting the church. I thought if we could just get this thing off the ground, we're, we're good to go. But then I went home that afternoon and realized we have to do this again in six or seven more days, and I bet... Some people won't show up that showed up today. So we got we to keep doing it, right? And if you're in this mode, success we'll talk about in a moment if it's right or wrong, period. But what I want to say is this. There's no amount of success that's going to be able to sustain you in a way that brings endless joy unceasingly. And we've seen this in our world, and we think somehow it's going to be different. Or like Madonna, we've had lots of success. Now, if you've had some success, you know what she's saying about that fading thing where now you've got to go after it again. If you've not had a ton of success, maybe because you've chose the wrong industry, or you've just not won, or God likes to humble you, or you're just young, whatever the case may be. If you've not had a lot of success, you think that what Madonna's saying can't possibly be true. Because you know when you finally win, when you finally get a job that works, when you finally hit your quota, when you finally make it into that director level position, you know that that will be all it takes in terms of success and you'll never need another thing again. But it will never be enough. It'll never be, you can't win enough. You can't get enough awards or plaques. You can't get enough recognition. You can't beat everyone else all the time and still find that to be the thing that works for you in the end. So here's the question. If success by itself can't be enough to hold the weight of our greatest hopes and our deepest longings, does it have a place in our lives at all? And this is where you're like, oh, I'm in church. I'm sure he's going to say success is stupid. Does it have a place at all? Here's what I think. I think it depends on our definition of success and the motivation underlying our success. 
All right, so let's talk about definition of success and the motivation that's underlying our success. I want to spend the rest of the time talking about a couple of things. One, about how Jesus thought about success, and number two, how we should begin to think about success. And so before we get into the scriptures for today, let me just remind you what we're after as a church, or if you've never been here, let me tell you what we're after as Epic Church for the first time. The vision of Epic Church is to see an increasing number of people here in San Francisco orient our entire lives around Jesus. And we say that because of this. We believe that if he is Lord of our lives, if he's the one driving this ship, then we should get on board with whatever he tells us, not just for our Sundays, but how we do work, relationships, time management, money management, whatever it is, we think we should get around what his idea is about that particular thing. So when it comes to success, I'm not asking today, how do you define it? How do I define it? How does Epic Church define it? How does our city define it? How does your industry define it? How does professional sports define it? That's not what I'm asking today. We're always asking, though never always getting to it perfectly, we're always asking, what does Jesus intend for success to look like in my life? So if you have a Bible, John chapter 4, if you need one, just raise your hand. We will get one to you. And I also want to let you know, in case you have... uh, Uh, don't have this version. We're we're now teaching from the NIV translation, so it's just the New International Version. Uh, That's that's from today moving forward, and so uh, if you need to download that, I'm sure there's a great, like, guest Wi-Fi thing going on here at Epic. So if you need a Bible to follow along, keep your hands up, and then stand with me. We're going to look at John 4, 34, just that one verse. Go ahead and stand, and then we're going to get into verse, uh, chapter 17, verse 4, and so if you need to know where we're going, 4.34, 17.4, 4.34, 17.4, driving home the same idea. In John 4, if you've been to church at all or maybe even heard some of the stories, you may know about this one. Jesus is tired with his disciples from the journey they've been on, and he um, sits down at Jacob's well, and he's there by himself. The disciples go into town to get some food, and, uh, and while they're gone, there's a woman, a Samaritan woman with uh, not a great reputation. She's there, and so it's just Jesus and her, him a Jewish man, her a Samaritan woman, not supposed to interact, but they begin this conversation, and Jesus really realizes she's coming to get physical water, but says to this woman, if you knew who I was and what I'm offering you in this moment, you would ask me for living water and I would give it to you. I would quench your thirst. What you're looking to to be enough in your life, I want to take care of that for you. And he's always saying the same thing to us. If we're looking to sex, he's saying, I've got something that's longer lasting. If we're looking to money, I've got something that's better. If we're looking to success, I've got something better. And so the disciples go in to buy food. They come back and they say to Jesus, you need to eat. I'm sure Jesus told him, like I would have said to one of you, um, I've already got a mom and you're not her. But that would have been a good one. Instead, he says this, chapter 4, verse 34. He says, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. How do I define success? Jesus says, I define success by doing what God called me to do and completing it. I'm, and this is what I'm about. So this is early on with Jesus and the disciples. Now you can turn over to 17.4, just a few pages over to the right. He's saying to his disciples, what I'm after, what my accomplishment's going to look like, how I'm going to judge whether or not I was successful is whether I do the thing he sent me for and I complete the thing he sent me to do. Now in 17.4, Here's what Jesus does. This is known as the high priestly prayer. If you read through John 17, what he begins to do is just, he's having a a conversation with God about him and God to begin with. Then he goes into praying for the current disciples. And then he wraps it up in 20 through 26 by praying for those who would believe, all believers in the future, anytime, any place. So he's including us in that prayer. But he begins the prayer by basically saying to God, as he's going to the cross, he's talking about what he's accomplished and whether or not he's been successful, at least in his definition. And here's what it says in verse 4. He says to God, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing, by completing the work that you gave me to do. I want this to serve us in a few ways. I want it to be how we define success. I want it to be something that we memorize. And I want this to become the evaluation tool as we're asking ourselves today and long into the future, is my life, is my life, successful. I want 17.4 to be what comes to our minds. Go ahead and have a seat. So as I just mentioned, I want to build the rest of this talk off of John 17.4, see what Jesus said, but also how do we lock into his definition of success? So he's saying to God the Father, Father, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. I want to break it down. I want the flow to go really through three parts. Right off the bat, Jesus gets to his motivation. 
He gets to his why. And when it comes to success, what you need to do pronto is get to your why. Why is more important than your what. It is more important than your how. Simon Sinek wrote a book called Start With Why. Not a Christian leader, just a great leadership book, but all about, I think the same thing Jesus is saying, what matters most is why I did what I did. The motivation undergirding my pursuit of success. So let me ask you this question. What's the motivation behind your pursuit of success? What's the why that you get up and go after it? Why do you forego sleep? Why do you meet with people? Why do you ask for money? Why do you wake up and go, I've got a to-do list. What is your why? And here's the very tricky thing about motivation. Motivation can never be seen publicly. Right? I didn't say we couldn't say what our motivation is, but I can't look into your heart and you can't look into mine. Do you know why I do this job? Do you know? No. I just needed a stage. That's why we started a church. I just needed people to clap. You're the best. That's, that's really what I'm doing here. You should go find a different church. I'm just kidding. That's not really what I'm doing here. But you don't know that. Even if I told you why and what my motivation was, you wouldn't know that it's actually true. You need to really think about why do you do what you do? Because success can be a thing that God has for us. I totally believe that, unless our motivation is off. There's a great book written in the 60s called Spiritual Leadership by a guy named J. Oswald Sanders. It's what I recommend for anyone who's considering um, spiritual leadership, not like working at a church, just, just in your business, leading because of your faith. And here's what he says about motivation and success. I, I hope his definition of motivation and, and kind of success, I hope that it frees you in some ways. Here's what he says. Desiring to excel is not a sin. Isn't that good? Some of you have been placed, you're like, oh, you shouldn't try to be the best because you're a Christian. That's a bunch of you know what. But he says it is motivation that determines ambition's character. So desiring to win isn't the problem. Excelling, succeeding, whatever your deal is accomplishing, that's not the problem. It's motivation that determines the character of your ambition. Our Lord never taught against the urge to high achievement, right? Jesus was never going around going, hey, just be mediocre. Be status quo. Don't ever win. But he did expose and condemn unworthy motivation. Why you go after it matters more than what it is you're going after. Let me say it again. Why you're going after what you're going after matters more than what it is you're actually going after. Jesus said, I have brought you glory on earth. He's saying to the Father, you knew what I told the disciples. Like, this is my motivation. This is my why. I am here. The only reason I'm here is to lift you up, to have people see who you are, to see your goodness, to see uh, the weight of who you are, the glory, give you credit. That's what my life is about. That is my why. Paul, writing in, to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he's writing to them about freedom from having to eat certain things. Like He's like, no, you shouldn't hold certain people to these standards or that standard. He, he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever it is that you do, whatever, circle whatever if you've got a Bible on you and, and it's not your friend's Bible that doesn't like to be written in, whatever, do it all for the glory of God. Of God. So friends, go be a chef. Go be a venture capitalist. Go be a stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home dad. Be a grad student. Go into retirement as long as that's what God has for you. But whatever it is that you do, whatever, do it all for the glory of God. I think about the psalmist's words in Psalm 115 verse 1 where he says, not to us, O God, not to us, but to your name be the glory. Just like we talked about, the hardest thing in life is going to be living for God's will and not your own will. One of the hardest things also that's paired with it is living for someone's glory that's not you. What would it look like to do your work, to be successful for the glory of God? And here's a great way to track the proper, uh, whether your motivation's proper. And here's a great way, great way to track that is this question. Does anyone else benefit when you succeed? When you win, does anybody else win? You're like, yeah, they don't win as much as I do, but they're, you know, <laughs> some nice little gifts for them. Do you succeed in a way that brings benefits to those around you or to somewhere in the world, even if it's your family, if it's this community, if it's your coworkers, when you win, does anyone else win? So when you think about your motivation, really those two questions, 
Are we doing it for the glory of God, like Jesus is leading us to think about success? And are we doing it in a way that other people are able to benefit? So that's the first part. I brought you glory on earth. I brought you glory. That's my motivation. That's my why. The second part, Jesus says, is um, I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work. Friends, you need to know that if we're going to be successful in God's eyes, it is going to take work. Sometimes I'm in settings that I think people think because we're Christians now, we should be less driven than the rest of the world. You know what I say about that? Oh, I can't say it at church, but um, that's not so. We have the Spirit of God in us. We believe that everyone lives for forever. We believe that what we do in this life affects the life to come. We should be of all people, the most driven people on the planet, as long as we're driven to the right thing and for the right reason. Who should be more driven than we are? No one, but for the right thing and for the right reason. Paul had a very similar definition of success to Jesus. You'll see it on the screen in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. They were letting Paul know that, Paul, there's trouble if you keep moving forward with your mission. If you keep trying to be successful according to this definition, there's trouble. Here's what Paul said. Tell me if this sounds like what Jesus said as well. Paul said, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim, circle that word. My only aim is to finish similar to Jesus, the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. Here's the task, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. He said, I make it my only aim. He's like, I don't care how they define success. And you need to know if you think you've been successful, go and read Paul's track record in Philippians chapter three. You don't know success like he knew success. And he said, that's not how I'm going to define success for my life any longer. My success is is going to be detailed in this way. Did I do what he gave me to do? And any of us who think that ambition's a bad thing, do you think Paul had a little bit of ambition? In a day and time when there were no cars, no planes, no internet, he couldn't video cast himself into multiple churches. The guy planted 20 plus churches. Anybody ever started one church or one business? 20, anybody? He went after it like no one else, maybe in the first century with the exception of Jesus himself. Ambition's not bad. He went after it, and his definition of success was incredibly costly to him, just like Jesus' definition of success was costly to him. You see, when we define success with the question of, am I doing what God's called me to do? Am I finishing the work he's assigned me to do? We should be willing to go after it, even when it's costly. And friends, it is going to, at some point in time, be costly. If it's never costly to you or to me, we're probably not getting success God's way. Give me one great Bible story that you love to read about and there wasn't a cost involved. Give me one. It doesn't exist, which means this. Your story is going to include it as well. It's going to be costly. The guy is beaten. He's in prison. He gets shipwrecked. But that wasn't... His, def- his definition of success wasn't avoiding pain. It was doing whatever it is that God gave him to do. Whatever. Whatever, whatever, whatever. So he finishes the work. So Jesus says, I brought glory to you on earth. That's my motivation. By finishing the work, I gave it everything that I had. And then the third part is really where I want to camp out that I think can be the most freeing part for everyone in the room this morning. He says, God, it was the work you gave me to do. The work you gave me to do. Jesus could have done anything and been successful. Do you agree? Thanks. That'd be bad to say no in church. "Mm." And people wanted to have Jesus define success in other ways. Some people wanted him just to get into a series of magic tricks, essentially. Some people wanted him to be a militant Messiah. Have you read those parts? They wanted him to come with an army in the way that they physically thought about armies. I think about what Satan wanted Jesus to do for success. He wanted him to find success by being able to turn stones into bread, by jumping off a cliff and essentially catching himself, by bowing down to Satan and worshiping him so that he might get the world. I think about even Peter, right? One of his disciples who loved Jesus. He had some different ideas of success for Jesus. Do you remember? Right? And don't hate on Peter. We would have been the same way, right? We would have loved him. Be like, please avoid that. Right? Jesus is wanting to wash the feet of the disciples. Peter's like, "Mm mm-mm. Later on, Peter tried to keep Jesus from being arrested. You remember when he cut the guy's ear off? He meant well, but Jesus says to him, 
in a place, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because I'm tempted to define success in a different way, Peter, but I've got to go through with it God's way. You will be tempted to define success how everyone out there defines it. The problem with that is at the end of your life, God isn't going to ask, did you hold up their definition? The work you gave me to do, there are two things I want to free you from in this moment. It's the work God gave you to do, not the work God gave everyone else or someone else to do. In today's world, we can compare ourselves better than ever, can't we? If you're on a sales team, you know where your sales are stacked along with everyone else's, right? Social media, you know how many followers and friends you have, whatever that means, compared to everyone else. As a pastor now, I know the size of every single one of my pastor friend's churches. So you know what we can do all day long? I need to pursue success like you have for them. I need to be wired like you wired them. We need to go after what they're going after. And it's just this endless and pointless thing for us to run after what God's called everyone else to do and forsake and forfeit what he's called us to do. Do you know at the end of your life what he's going to ask you? Did you do what I asked you to do? Not did you do what I asked them to do. And some of you need to be freed from that today. If success for you in your mind is becoming a CEO of something and God didn't have that for you, you need to get on board with what he has for you. The work you gave me to do. The work you gave me to do. Anyone miserable in your current work because you're pursuing something God never gave you? Anyone receive a dream from God and yet you've buried it in the sand because you quickly discovered that the world doesn't call that success? You are miserable. Whatever it's supposed to bring you, it's not bringing you because you're playing outside the lanes of what God created you to do. So God, it's the work you gave me to do. I want to be content with that. I want to sink my teeth into that, however big or small, however public or private, whatever it means or doesn't mean for me in terms of the world's eyes. But not only is it the work God gave you to do and the work he didn't give everyone else to do, it's the work that God gave you to do, not the work someone else gave you to do. Do you know when your life is over, you won't stand before your industry and tell them how successful you were? You know that? Thank God, right? You won't stand before before the investors of your company in that moment. You won't stand before the culture and city of San Francisco and and they tell you, here's this, and some of you need to be freed from this, all right? And most of them aren't here, so I'm going to say this. You're not going to stand before your parents and be awarded based on what you did with their expectations of success. You'll stand before God. And no matter what you've done in the world's eyes, the question will absolutely be, will absolutely be, what was your motivation Did you finish it? Was it what I gave you to do? And can I just say this, and can we give some grace to each other? Let's quit going after what everyone else says we must go after and just ask ourselves and rally each other around the concept of this is what God has for me, and I will be content to do it. And if no one ever knows it, and if it doesn't make a ton of money, and if it never gets me on the front pages, I will be content because he's the God of the universe. He's wired me. He's gifted me. He's given me a boundary, and I get to live out the life he made me to live. Maybe it's not for you. Maybe this is just for me. But I'm just sick and tired of going, oh, I've got to be like that pastor. We've got to be exactly like that church. We'll never be as big as that. I'll never be as influential as this. I'll never get invited to speak there. It's time for us to die to it. I'm not saying be mediocre. I'm saying redefine success. Here's why success can never be enough in what we're talking about in this series. Sometimes we go after the wrong thing. Sometimes we go after the right thing, but for the wrong reason. And sometimes we're asking success to be what only God can be for us. And you need to be freed from that idea today. Would you pray with me? The question I asked earlier was, does anyone benefit from your success? And as we think about the success Jesus had, um, and we ask the question, does anyone benefit from his success? So many of us are already raising our hands, like absolutely, Ben grace because of his success, redemption, eternal life. But if that's not you, if you've never enjoyed the benefits of the success Jesus brought about, you're encouraged to take a step of faith today and say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being so locked in because your success has brought me freedom from my sin. It's brought me this new life and hope and joy. 
And then for the rest of us, aren't we just sick and tired of trying to play by everyone else's definitions? It's exhausting. It's depressing. It makes us feel like we're always missing it. And then some of you, you've gotten the world's definition of success, but it's left you hollow. And maybe it's not that you're going after the wrong thing, but maybe it's for the wrong reason that you're going after it. Could we adopt Jesus' definition of success to bring God glory on earth by finishing in the work that he gave us to do? There's no better blessing or freedom waiting for you than to live and operate out of that space and that mindset. God, I pray that you will come and sink the truth we've talked about into this community. Lord, help us to encourage each other to, to, to redefine to really line up with what you've called us to do, to bring you glory, to finish your work, the work you gave us to do, not that someone else gave us to do, not that you gave someone else to do. So come and free us, God. We want to offer our lives to you in a fresh way this morning. God, what we want to pursue is you. And God, as you reveal and you clarify what our lives are to be about, we just want to say on the front end, we really want to do that thing. But God, you know the temptations that will get in the way. So God, we just want to offer ourselves in this moment. Ask you to help keep us on the path that you created us to walk. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with me as Brad and the band lead us just in this song about, God, I really want to surrender everything. I want to surrender my will. I want to, I want to give everything to you. I'm not going to hold back. And at the end of your life, you're going to be asked, what did you do with what he gave you to do? That will be all that matters one day.